In the first unit, we went over some background information and learned how to go through flowchart algorithms. Now, in the second unit, we begin the actual number theory portion of the course with divisibility. So let's start off with talking about factors. Here's our first definition. Suppose a and b are two integers. If there is a third integer k, so that a times k is equal to b, then we can say any of the following, they all mean the same thing. A is a factor of B, or we flip it around and say that B is a multiple of A. A is a divisor of B is the same thing, or B is divisible by A. I will tend to use these words that conjure up the notion of division less frequently. I'll usually use the word factor or multiple instead. But when we're writing it out, we'll just write A and then this vertical line, B. And this you speak out loud as simply A is a factor of B. This is the first definition of the course. It really underpins everything we're going to be talking about for quite some time. Don't think of factoring in terms of going into another number an even or a whole number of times or any of these sort of phrases that you may have picked up over the years. A lot of people roll their eyes at the definition of what it means to be a factor and just sort of say, well, I know what that means already. Really learn it in terms of this formal definition. Okay, this formal definition, a is a factor of b if there exists a k so that a times k equals b will make future work in theorems and proofs so much easier. Learn it on its own terms, not some other phrasing you may have heard before. So let's look at a few examples of factoring. Here's a statement, 3 is a factor of 12. Why is this true? Because there is an integer k, specifically 4, so that 3 times k is equal to 12. 3 times 4 is equal to 12. So according to the definition, it is true that 3 is a factor of 12. But here is another statement. 3 is not a factor of 11. But I can't just say that it doesn't go into it evenly or 11 over 3 isn't an integer because we don't actually have a notion of division like that yet. So here's how we're going to prove that 3 is not a factor of 11. We're going to do it indirectly. Assume to the contrary that 3 is a factor of 11. So there must be an integer so that 3 times k is equal to 11. Well, 3 times 3 is 9, which is too small. So whatever k is, it has to be bigger than 3. But 3 times 4 is 12, and that's too big. So whatever k is, it has to be less than 4. But there are no integers that are in between 3 and 4, so there is no k, so that 3 times k is equal to 11, therefore k, uh, 3 is not a factor of 11, based on the original definition of what it means to be factors. Okay, if a is a factor of b, we typically use this vertical line notation. And if a is not a factor of b, we can do our typical math thing, which is to strike out the symbol. a is not a factor of b. We'll use this symbol right here, the vertical line, but struck through. All right, here's a theorem. For any a, which is an integer, we have a as a factor of itself. In other words, we're defining a relation on the integers, and we can do so by saying that one integer is related to the second if the first is a factor of the second, and we're claiming this is a reflexive relationship, that any integer is a factor of itself. But we do have to prove that. So because the claim starts off with for any integer, we start our proof with suppose you have an arbitrary integer. Now what we need to do is prove a is a factor of itself. But what was the definition of this? The definition of a being a factor of itself is there exists an integer k such that a times k is equal to a. The first is a factor of the second. If the first times something is equal to the second, it just so happens these are both a. Is there an integer k so that a k equals a? Sure, one. a times one is equal to a. So I was able to solve this. So there does exist an integer so that a times k is a. Therefore, this, is, this definition is satisfied and a is a factor of itself. Well, if that relation is shown to be reflexive, can we show it's transitive? The claim is for any three integers, if a is a factor of b and b is a factor of c, then a is a factor of c. In other words, this relation that we're describing is also transitive. Well, we do have to prove it, but again, we're claiming this is true about 
any integers a, b, and c. So the proof says, suppose I have three integers a, b, and c. But we then have a conditional statement. If something, then something else. We're going to do a direct proof. Assume the hypothesis. Assume that a is a factor of b and b is a factor of c. So we said for any a, b, and c, so let a, b, c be arbitrary integers. If something, so assume that a is a factor of b and b is a factor of c, but now our goal is to show that a must be a factor of c. But let's exploit some definitions. Since a is a factor of b, we know there is an integer k sub 1, so that b is equal to a times k1. Since b is a factor of c, there is another integer k2, so that c is equal to b times k2. Notice, I can't use this same integer here. It might be true that these are the same integer, but I have no way of knowing that, so I'm not using the same letter. Okay, I'm using a different symbol here and here. k sub 1, k sub 2 are both integers. Maybe they're the same, but I don't know that. Now what we need to show is that a is a factor of c. But if we put together these two things that come from our assumptions, c is equal to b times k2, but b was equal to a times k1. Therefore, c is equal to a times k1 times k2. And k1 times k2 is just another integer. So I have written that c is equal to a times an integer. Therefore, a is a factor of c. And the proof is complete. We've said that this factoring relationship is reflexive and that it's transitive, so it's natural to ask, is it symmetric? No. There are a pair of integers a and b, so that a is a factor of b, but b is not a factor of a. So this relationship isn't symmetric. There exists a possible choice so that one being a factor of the other does not work the other way. So this factoring relationship is not an equivalence relation. While it is reflexive and while it is transitive, it's not symmetric. But we do have to prove that as well. But we're only trying to prove that such a pair of integers exists, so let's actually make a specific choice. For example, a is 2 and b is 6. 2 times 3 equals 6, so 2 is a factor of 6. a is a factor of b. But we cannot solve 6 times k equals 2. Formally, we could go through a similar argument we did before. 6 times 0 would be too small, 6 times 1 would be too large, and there are no integers in between 0 and 1. Therefore, 6 is not a factor of 2, and so there existed a choice of integers where this factoring relationship worked in one order but not the other. Okay. This is actually a remarkably common error to think factoring is symmetric. A lot of students are just used to saying it doesn't matter what order I write things in. And so they'll write things like, since x is a factor of y, y must be a factor of x. But we are clearly stating here that's not always true. It's definitely possible to have a pair of numbers where the factoring works in one order, but not the other. Factoring is not symmetric. Now that we're talking about factors, let's talk about positive and negative factors. Well, suppose I have a pair of integers, a and b and a is a factor of b, then all of the following are true. a is a factor of minus b, minus a is a factor of b, negative a is a factor of negative b. Well, let's prove all of these. So we get to assume that a is a factor of b, so a times k is equal to b for some integer. Well, then a times negative k is equal to negative b. Negative a times negative k would be the same as a times k, which we assumed was b. And negative a times k is negative b, and that's just one by one all of the claims that we made. The content of this result is to say that when we're talking about factoring, whether a and b are positive or negative doesn't actually matter. Okay? If I just want to show a is a factor of b, I can replace b with minus b, I can replace a with minus a, I can replace both of them with minus a and minus b. Any one of these being true would immediately show that all of the other ones are. Factoring does not really care about positive versus negative. If all I want to know is whether one number is a factor of the other, I can replace each of those with uh, their negatives, their positives, it doesn't matter. So typically, we're not really going to be asking what are the factors of a number, but rather what are the positive factors of a number, because positive versus negative factoring is just not an interesting distinction. But if we don't specifically say positive factors, remember that negative numbers are also factors. So for example, the factors of 9 are not just 1, 3, and 9. 
Also, negative 1, negative 3, and negative 9 are factors of 9. But if you ask what are the positive factors of 9, 1, 3, and 9. Now that we've got the definition of factoring under our belts, let's go over some general results about it. So here's a theorem. For any integer, all of the following are true. 1 is a factor of a. a is a factor of 0. This one catches some people by surprise. And if 0 is a factor of a, then a has to equal 0. If a is a factor of 1, conversely, either a is plus or minus 1. Well, this is a claim about any integer, so let a be any integer. a times 1 is equal to a, so the first claim is proved. Okay? That we have already stated that a is a factor of itself through this thing right here, this equation. But this also shows that 1 is a factor of a. So 1 is a factor of a. But a times 0 is 0, so a times something was equal to 0. In other words, a is a factor of 0. But now if we assume that 0 is a factor of a, then there must be an integer so that 0 times k is equal to a. But 0 times k is definitely 0, therefore 0 equals a. And finally, if we assume that a is a factor of 1, then I have some solution to a times k is equal to 1. Well, a times k being a positive number means either both of them are positive or both of them are negative. If a is positive, then since a is an integer, it's at least as large as 1. Because if a is positive, it's at least as big as 1. If I multiply this by k, remember we assumed um, either they're both positive or they're both negative. If a is positive, then so is k. So multiply this inequality by the positive number k. You don't have to flip it. When we get a times k is bigger than or equal to k. Okay, but a times k was at least as large as 1. So 1 is at least as large as k. But k is positive. So what are positive numbers that are less than or equal to 1? The only one is 1. Now that I know k is 1, okay, then we get um, a times k is equal to 1 up here. But if k is 1, then a is equal to 1 as well. So if a is positive, then a must be 1. The only positive factor of 1 is 1 itself. But if you work through the same argument here, if a is negative, then so is k. So I would have a is less than or equal to minus 1. But when I multiply through by the negative number k, I would get exactly this inequality right here. Okay, And then since k is negative, we would get k is negative 1, and therefore a is negative 1 as well. So the only factors of 1 are plus or minus 1. Factoring works quite nicely with inequalities. Suppose a and b are positive integers and a is a factor of b, then a is less than or equal to b. Factors of an integer are not larger than it, as long as we're talking about positive numbers. So since we're assuming a is a factor of b, there must be an integer k, so that a times k is equal to b. Since a and b are both positive, that was one of our initial assumptions, k must be positive as well. So a is less than or equal to a times k, because k is bigger than or equal to 1. Okay, so since k is bigger than or equal to 1, a times k is, being, is a multiplied by something 1 or larger, so it's at least as large as a. But a times k is b, so a is less than or equal to b. Not much to it, and this is a result that we're all used to thinking about. As long as we're only talking about positive factors of positive numbers, the factors cannot be bigger than the number itself, and here's the proof. We've already remarked that factoring isn't a symmetric relation, but are there any choices of integers where it is? So suppose I have two integers a and b where factoring works both ways. a is a factor of b and b is a factor of a. Then either a is equal to b or negative b. Okay, the only way two numbers can both be factors of each other is if uh, they are equal or they're equal to each other up to a minus sign. So suppose I can solve a times something is equal to b and b times something is equal to a. If I combine these two equations, we get b is equal to a times k1, but a was b times k2. So b is equal to b times k1, k2. Therefore, if I subtract b over here and then factor out the b, we get 0 is equal to b times k1, k2 minus 1. The only way a product of two numbers can be 0, specifically the two numbers being b and k1, k2 minus 1, if this product is equal to 0, then one of the numbers itself was equal to 0. 
Therefore, B is 0 or K1, K2 is equal to 1. If B is 0, then BK2 equals A tells me that, in fact, A is 0 as well. And therefore, they're both equal. A is equal to B. But if K1, K2 is equal to 1, okay, the only way I can have a product equaling 1 means they're both factors of 1. And we know the only factors of 1 are plus or minus 1. Okay. So any way I plug in K1 and K2 being plus or minus 1 up into the original assumption here tells me that A is equal to plus or minus B. So while in general factoring is not symmetric, what we've shown is that when it is, if you actually find a pair of integers that are factors of each other, then those two integers are the same up to a plus or minus sign. Here we have a theorem that's going to be not too difficult to prove, but it's going to be surprisingly important for us as the course goes on. Suppose I have three integers a, b, and c, so that a is a factor of b and also a factor of c. Notice we're not setting up transitivity here. We have a is a factor of b and then a is a factor of c. Well, under that assumption, for any integers x and y, a must be a factor of b times x plus c times y. Well, we get to assume that a is a factor of b and a is a factor of c, so there are integers k1 and k2 that satisfy these equations right here. Then for any x and y, bx plus cy is going to be equal to, well, b was equal to a times k1 and c was equal to a times k2, and notice that I can now factor an a out of this. So bx plus cy is a times this whole mess right here. While this is a little uglier to look at, it's the product of two integers plus the product of two integers, overall it's an integer. And we have bx plus cy is a times an integer. By definition, a is a factor of bx plus cy. So that's it. That's the proof of this theorem. But trust me, we're going to be using this a whole lot. Anytime a is a factor of two numbers, b and c, it must be a factor of any what is called linear combination of them, b times an integer plus c times an integer. Most commonly, we're going to be letting one of those two integers be plus, uh, 1 versus minus 1. So for example, if a is a factor of both b and c, then it's a factor of b plus c. Here, x and y are both 1. It's also a factor of b minus c. This would be letting x equal 1 and y equal minus 1. There's an interesting corollary we can uh, put together that a is a factor of b implies that a is a factor of b minus a, but it also goes the other way. If a is a factor of b minus a, then we can prove a is a factor of b. So we know that a is a factor of a. Every integer is a factor of itself. So if I assume that a is a factor of b, then I can do this little trick here and say a is a factor of b minus the other thing it's a factor of, specifically itself. But in the other direction, if a is a factor of b minus a, and I know that a is a factor of a, then a is a factor of the sum of those two things. And now the a's cancel out, and we just get that a is a factor of b. So a being a factor of b is logically equivalent to a being a factor of b minus a. So we're going to develop an algorithm to check whether the statement a is a factor of b is true or not. Remember, factoring doesn't distinguish between positive versus negative factors. Okay? I would never ask, is negative 6 a factor of x? I could just ask, is 6 a factor of x? It would be the same question. So we're not going to work with negative numbers. a and b are both going to be natural numbers. We also happen to know that 0 is a factor of b only when b is 0. Okay? So if I'm asking whether a is a factor of b, it's not a terribly interesting question when a is 0. It will make the algorithm slightly simpler to simply require that this a, the thing which may or may not be a factor of b, to not be 0, to actually be a positive integer. Well, here's the algorithm. Okay, let's try to understand how it works. k starts at 0, and then what we do is we ask, is k at least as large as b? If not, add a to it. Now, a is a positive integer. So as I keep cycling through this loop, I start at 0, then I add a to it, so I'm at a. Then I might have to add a again, 2 times a. Add a again, 3 times a, 4 times a, 5 times a, 6 times a, and so forth. 
So k is a sort of temporary value that's just um, incrementing up through the multiples of a, a, 2a, 3a, and so forth, until you are bigger than or equal to b, at which point you exit that loop. So I know that k is a multiple of a. The first one that's bigger than or equal to b, I ask, was it equal to b? If k is a multiple of a and it's equal to b, well then yes, b is a multiple of a. In other words, a is a factor of b. If, however, the multiples of a are smaller than b and then never equal, so it jumps right to being bigger than b, then there was no multiple of a that was equal to b and therefore a is not a factor of b. So that's how this algorithm here works. Okay. We required a to be positive so that this algorithm terminates. If we allowed a equals zero, adding a would never change the value of k. So if this was false, you wouldn't change the value of k and it would remain false forever. So a not being zero was required to make this loop terminate. You could fix that by first checking, instead of going um, right to here, just check. If a is zero, just ask is b also zero and have a separate exit from this algorithm. It wouldn't be that difficult to sort of shoehorn that in, I, but I wanted to focus on the case when the uh, factor a is positive. Well, if we have an iterative algorithm to check whether a is a factor of b when a and b are non-negative integers, can we develop a recursive algorithm to do the same thing? Sure. We're going to rely on a slightly different knowledge set. Specifically, we know as long as a and b are non-negative integers, if a is uh, bigger than or equal to b or b is less than or equal to a, then a is a factor of b only when a is equal to b, and also a is a factor of b if and only if a is a factor of b minus a. So here's the recursive algorithm. Note that there are no loops. We start off the same, input two natural numbers where a has actually got to be positive, okay? If b is less than or equal to a, and I'm asking, is a a factor of b, then I go here. If they are both equal, then yeah. If a is equal to b, then a is a factor of b. If they're not, then b is actually smaller than a, and therefore a can't be a factor of b. Okay, so if b is less than or equal to a, there's a quick check to determine whether a is a factor of b. What if a is smaller than b? Well then, instead of checking if a is a factor of b, check if a is a factor of b minus a, since we know that these two things are equivalent. If I wanted to know that a was a factor of b or not, instead, let's check if a is a factor of b minus a. Because now I've made this number here smaller, I've subtracted a from it. So when I check if it's less than or equal to a, now that might be true and triggering my easy exit. But if it's not, simply subtract a again and try over and over and over. Okay, so run through this algorithm on your own to try to get a handle on how it happens to check whether, for example, three is a factor of 12 or three is a factor of 11. The first, of course, is true and the second is false, but you should be able to run through this algorithm and get the correct responses.